All good? Thumbs up. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we'll hop into our counter offer. Hey, buddy. Morning. And Tone, we'll just have you mute so we don't have to listen in on your private conversation. Thank you. It's all good. Okay, so here we are um, in the center screen. We have the counter offer um, document up. And we're just going to take it line by line and go through it. Um, if you have any questions or experiences that you'd like to uh, chat about or bring up, please feel free to. Um, and in the meantime, we'll just keep working our way through the document. Let me pull the laser up. Okay. Okay, so at the very top, all of the contract documents have the reviewed by, and this is where the name of the reviewing broker is going to um, go. Uh, from time to time, I see the letters BIC included here as opposed to the ability for the reviewing broker to actually insert a printed name. Please um, either type in the name of the broker who's reviewing based on taking a look at the schedule to see who's on uh, shift at that time or another alternative is to simply include a, a text box uh, for the reviewing broker to type in their name because we do want to have that uh, printed name and then the signature in the center. Brokerage firm, of course, is going to be EXP. Our second line down, counter offer reference date. So the date that this uh, counter offer is drafted and circulated. Uh, we're not referencing any other document, but we're inserting the date that this counter offer um, is being signed and circulated. And then of course we want to um, include who is submitting it. Is it the buyer countering the seller or the seller countering the buyer? Uh, next up is the purchase contract, contract reference date. Um, and we just take that off of page one of the purchase contract. And then we're including the seller's name, the buyer's name, and the um, correct property address uh, or reference, and the TMK number according to the county records. Um, before we continue, I do want to make note for the group. Um, very important to understand the flow of the negotiation process and offer submittals. So initially, we have a buyer who submits an offer, purchase contract to a listing agent. Um, and then from there, the offer, of course, will either be accepted, rejected, or countered back. Um, and from there, it's very possible to have a subsequent counter um, go back and forth. Um, or subsequent counters go back and forth. And it's very important to know that at the end of the negotiation upon acceptance, the only documents that prevail and move forward um, are going to be the original purchase contract and the last uh, and final counter offer that was agreed to. So any uh, information or additions, deletions, terms that we are including in counter offers that are going back and forth um, if they are not if that specific language is not continued on to the final counter offer it's as if it hasn't existed and it doesn't apply and it's not valid as part of the contract does that make sense to everybody gonna get a thumbs up or want to dive into that a little bit because we're not ever going to have a purchase contract and two counter offers, right? We're always only going to have one purchase contract and the final counter offer. 
So very important that if there were any um, terms in there about inclusions of furniture or timelines, um, anything that was included in subsequent or previous counteroffers does need to be carried on over into the final counteroffer. I'm glad I'd like you're to ask highlighting that because for different states that's completely different than for me that was a big learning experience coming to Hawaii. Mm, thanks for sharing Anna Maria. Um, what state uh, were you coming from? Um, I'm still licensed in California as well and from there on in California every every counter offer is part of the history and taken in consideration. Wow, big difference. Big difference. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> um, here's a question for the group. After a buyer submits their purchase contract to a listing agent or to a seller, can they counter their own offer if they wanted to make any changes as opposed to writing a new offer? Thank you, Raquel. That is the correct answer. Yes. So that is a, another possibility. Uh, Courtney, thank you for that clarification. As long as it has, uh, as long as the original offer hasn't been accepted, correct. Um, in that case, we would need to use um, an amendment or an addendum to make any changes. What would be the correct document? So, on tone, wouldn't be an addendum, unfortunately. Courtney, you're correct. It would be an amendment. Thanks, Duane Lynn. Yep, an amendment because if the seller has accepted the offer, it's a fully executed document. And then from there, we always use amendments to make any uh, changes. So, thanks for the chiming in on that little piece there. No problem. So we're going to go back to our counteroffer document on the screen. So we talked about the standard information that's always inserted at the top of the document. Um, now we're going to touch on the expiration. Right? So we want to let the client on, or the person on the other side know uh, when does our offer expire. And we're just simply inserting the date and the time um, that they will need to accept, counter, or reject our uh, counteroffer. Below this language um, just reinforces the point that we just talked about. Um, it says this counter offer cancels and supersedes any and all prior counter offers. All previous counter offers that have not been fully executed are null and void. All terms and conditions from any prior counter offers that are to be retained must be restated in this counter offer. So if you guys um, are following along with the hard copy, that's a great sentence to just highlight or underline um, for your reference. And then below that, we have some more standard language. Uh, this counter offer is an agreement to sell and buy the above described property on the terms and conditions set forth in the purchase contract as amended by this counter offer. Buyer and seller acknowledge receipt of a copy of this counter offer. This counter offer can be withdrawn at any time prior to the delivery of a written acceptance to the undersigned brokerage firm. Okay. If an agent is withdrawing the counter offer how do they go about that if they want to withdraw the counter offer prior to it being accepted what would be the way for an agent to do that any guesses And the answer is very simple. Uh, and tone, in Virginia, we send a termination and release. Sounds pretty formal. 
um, here we can just send a quick email. So anything that we can document in written format uh, via email um, to advise the other side that the client has decided to withdraw their offer is um, a suitable means to communicate that over to the other side. A formal document is not needed in this case, but just uh, a, an email to notify them. Okay. So continuing on, instructions to the receiving party. Number one, to accept or reject this counter offer, complete the box section entitled acceptance or rejection of the counter offer and indicate acceptance or rejection. Um, that's going to be on page two um, in the lower section, um, this area here. And we'll circle back to that um, when we complete on to page two. Okay. Number two, the option is to make a new counter offer. Complete a counter offer form with a new counter offer reference date. Okay. And um, number three, alternatively, buyer may submit a new purchase contract. Okay. Uh, what we don't want to see is for changes to be made on a counter offer that's submitted by the other side. Um, by way of striking out or amending the counter offer. Um, so we want to always keep it very clean. And when we receive the document, either we are accepting it as it's drafted and completed, or we are creating a new document, um, of changing out anything that uh, needs to be addressed. Okay, fill in all check boxes. So same direction as um, what's given on the purchase contract. We want to write NC if no change and X if there is a change. Um, in the blanks provided, clearly identify the specific changes, deletions, or additions which comprise the terms of this purchase contract. And so they've made note here um, specifically that the um, what should be written is NC and not um, NA. So NC stands for no change, NA stands for not applicable. And the most common area that we see that um, is when we are, uh, as a mistake, right, that we wanna avoid um, is when we're referring um, the money box uh, section C2. So we never wanna put NA in the uh, section C2 because we don't want any of the funds to be not applicable uh, we just, it maybe in some cases, don't need to make a change there. So just a note to make on the side. Um, section A. So just like the purchase contract is laid out um, alphabetically in order, um, so is the counter offer. And so starting at the top, um, section A, in the brackets next to it, either marking an X or an NA, um, if whichever applies. And um, sometimes we do need to correct either the name of a brokerage um, or whether or not um, a bracket check was missed to identify if that particular brokerage um, is a member of the NAR. Okay. Section B uh, is relating to the earnest money deposit. And here we indicate if there are any changes um, is uh, there going to be an increase, a decrease, um, and if no change, it would simply be NC for no change. Okay, money box section here. Um, sometimes agents need to make adjustments as far as what they, um, what their client would like to see as far as the number for a down payment. Um, perhaps they'd like to request an additional deposit. Um, or change what that amount looks like. And um, making sure that if we are receiving an offer on the buyer's side um, and we're doing a counter offer, once in a while we can see a discrepancy um, if we're receiving a pre approval letter from a buyer um, and the numbers that they've included in the offer don't quite match up with my, what might be indicated on a pre-approval letter. So always a good idea to cross-reference the numbers um, and make sure that 
the amounts that the buyers have indicated in the contract do match what um, pre-approvals they're receiving from lenders um, and make any adjustments if necessary. So always in the details. Down at the bottom in bold, should buyer fail to make the initial earnest money deposit or additional deposit when due, seller may elect to terminate this purchase contract pursuant to paragraph 01. So just as the stipulations um, are cited in the purchase contract, they are recited here in bold letters on the counter offer. Any questions on page one? Anything, everything is pretty straightforward for the most part and, and fill in you know, the areas that apply. But from time to time, um, there may be uh, unusual things that pop up um, that we can address. So page two, second page of the counter offer, um, next section D, addenda. This is one that uh, we often need to use if we are an EXP um, listing agent and we receive a purchase contract offer from a buyer who's not affiliated with our company, then, um, and likely they have not included the standard EXP addendum, um, we as a broker team reviewing your contracts will um, have the expectation that a listing agent is taking the initiative to insert those EXP standard addendum. The two standard addendum that apply to all islands are going to be the affiliated business arrangement disclosure and the EXP wire fraud um, advisory. Those are two that should be made a part of every contract. And from there, um, on the island of Oahu, Currently, there is a city and county of Honolulu uh, short-term rental uh, disclosure that's required to be attached to each offer. On the Big Island, um, specifically, we have the Hawaii Island um, buyer's disclosure. And so depending on the county in which you're conducting your business practice, um, we just want to be aware of any of those um, unique documents we need to make sure are included. Courtney, thanks for bringing up a point. Um, so from time to time, um, the other side um, who's seeing the documents are just not in agreement uh, to, to sign them. And that's okay. So we as a, as a company and broker team are advising agents that we just uh, at minimum need to ensure that we are including them um, as a notification to the other side. So we can include them and attach them, uh, make note of them um, on the counter offer. However, if the um, client on the other side is not ag in agreement to sign and return them, that's okay. We have documented our um, intention and um, effort to make sure that they were aware of those disclosures. From time to time, uh, we can make uh, other another exception um, if there's a real challenge and a threat to your client's offer being um, considered or accepted. Um, but that nine out of ten times, you know, and higher, we can make sure that at least we're attaching and including those documents. Okay, so um, below section D, this remaining bracket is going to be for everything else in the purchase contract. So the following sections of the purchase contract, letters E through S, and or terms and conditions of any addenda are amended as follows. Please reference the appropriate section, paragraph, subparagraph or addenda as we're writing any additional terms out here. Um, the clearest way that we can make note of any of the space and, and make note of any changes is to label them, right? So number one, and, and then what that uh, section is, is it section H, is it section J, any of the sections, and then uh, what the change is. And there's a bazillion combinations of what that could look like. 
um, if anyone has any scenarios or questions, we can certainly um, chat about it as a group, um, but very straightforward. Keep it organized, uh, keep it clean, and um, as you need to do additional counter offers potentially, we just want to make sure we carry um, all of that information over. And once we have those terms in there um, and we're circulating it to the clients, we want to make sure that the submitting party is signing on the immediate lines below um, that main body above, including the date. And then as we touched on earlier, um, this box uh, below is going to be for um, acceptance or rejection. There are two brackets and they need to be the one that the client is electing needs to be either marked X or a checkbox. Um, they can initial it. We clearly want to um, advise the party who submitted the counteroffer what our uh, response is. They're going to sign it, indicate which party they are, the buyer or the seller, and they're going to date it. This reviewed by box here at the bottom, uh, just like the purchase contract on page 14, the brokerage that is receiving the counter offer, um, their reviewing broker will need to sign to acknowledge um, in this section here. Okay. And it's always a nice idea to include their brokerage firm name as a courtesy not required um, but it is one less thing that the other side uh, would need to fill in and that about wraps it up team um, we're at 9 36 we didn't even need an hour and a half um, but we've been able to touch on the amendment addendum and counter offer um, we can open it up and have a chat if anyone has um, questions, comments, let's talk about it. The quick question. So I was reading through the SOPs and, you know, I came from the Virginia EXP team. So all purchase offers, like if I'm representing a buyer, I fill it out and I send to the broker for signature. Is that correct? Great question. Yeah. So we actually always want to send for review first, if possible, in case there's any changes. That way, if you're sending for signatures initially, you don't have to resend it again. So send for review, attach documents as PDF. And then once you get the green light and a confirmation from the broker, then set it up in a signature platform and send it to the broker and to clients. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Courtney. So we do have um, some other documents that are used from time to time. And so I'll put it out there. Um, you know, if anyone has any plate anywhere else they need to be, you know, that's fine. Um, but we do have an early occupancy agreement and post occupancy contract. Jen, I'm not sure if you want to save this for separate class or if you want me to just kind of uh, briefly touch on them since we have a group present Ooh. very cool yeah and Tony, thanks for uh, sticking around for that we'll go through them we have the time um, for anyone else who's interested in um, kind of hearing along what those documents are and, and how we can fill them in feel free to stay um, and ask any questions along the way. Um, let me go ahead and get that on the screen. We'll start off with the um, early occupancy agreement. Three months into this and I'm still figuring out how to control my avatar. Apologies. <laughs> Okay. All right.
right, team. So early occupancy contract, um, it's a two-page document. And just as the, the title, um, uh, you can guess from the title, early occupancy contracts are designed to uh, give buyers an opportunity to move into the property um, prior to the closing date. So ahead of schedule, um, that's when we would use this document. Um, from time to time, it's used uh, and made a part of the contract at the time of the purchase contract negotiations and agreement. And other times um, there's a change in circumstance, maybe there's an extension um, and the close date is going to be pushed out further and the buyer's in a situation where um, they need housing. And so buyer and seller will, after the fact, um, well into the purchase contract uh, timeline, go ahead and execute this document and um, make the, the possibility there for the buyer. At the top, um, we're going to just jump right into it. Early occupancy contract is made a part of the purchase contract, right? So it's binding. We are going to reference the specific contract reference date, um, purchase contract reference date, the property address, and the TMK, standard for all the documents. Um, what you'll notice on this document, as well as the post-closing, as it does not require a broker's signature, but it is always a good idea to have um, the broker team review it, just to make sure that our I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, or maybe you need some assistance on how the information can be filled out according to your client's situation. Um, in bold here at the top, buyer is not a tenant under the Hawaii Landlord Tenant Code 521-7, subsection 8. Buyer may occupy the premise on a day-to-day -day basis subject to the following terms. The undersigned acknowledge that they have read, understand, and agree to the terms and conditions of this contract and have not relied upon the advice from licensees and or brokerage firms involved in this transaction. As with all of our documents, um, clients are always strongly um, advised to seek legal counsel um, and tax advice prior to signing this contract so they can understand any uh, implications that may uh, derive from it. So buyer and seller agree to the following, and we're just going to go through um, the numbers, subsec subsections. Um, number one, buyer's risk of loss and buyer's indemnification. So buyer does hereby release and discharge seller absolutely and forever from any and all claims, demands, or rights of actions or suits, which buyer now has or may have against seller arising out of or to arise out of or relating to or connected in any way with directly in or indirectly whether asserted or unasserted to date and whether known or unknown the activities of buyer or buyer's licensees and other representatives relating to the buyer's early occupancy of the property okay the next part of that, buyer will indemnify, hold harmless, and defend seller from any and all liability, claims, losses, damages, including foreseeable and unforeseeable consequential, da consequential damages, costs, and expenses, including attorney's fees directly or indirectly arising out of or attributable to the activities of buyer or buyer's licensees, or the representatives relating to the buyer's early occupancy of the property. Okay, so very strong warning um, about the responsibility that the buyer is taking on by taking possession of the property, right? They are releasing any uh, liability on the seller's behalf, on the agent's behalf, and um, and the exchange for that is that they have occupancy of the property prior to closing. Number two covers the occupancy date. So here's where we insert when um, the client um, is going to, the buyer client is going to take occupancy of the property. So we want to insert the date and the time of when that's going to occur. Okay. Um, typically, it can occur in the morning, first thing, 8 o'clock. It can happen at noon, um, kind of midday, 
or um, if the arrangement is necessary, uh, can happen at the end of the day. But um, as we go through this document, I think it's really important to um, make it clear that the buyer's agent and seller's agent should have an opportunity to discuss um, what's going to work for their clients. Um, certainly, as we draft the early occupancy contract um, on behalf of the buyer as the buyer's agent, we're going to want to put in terms that are ideal for our client. Um, everything does become negotiable, so we may um, receive changes or adjustments back from the listing agent after they've had a chance to review it. Um, therefore, it can be really helpful to spend a little bit of time as the buyer's agent if you know you're going to need to do an early occupancy agreement get on the phone have a conversation with the listing agent and just get an idea of what terms um, on a basic level are going to work for the seller client so we know um, we have a better idea of what we can insert into the uh, document that will be acceptable to the seller Okay. Number three, acceptance of the property. On the date of occupancy, all contingencies under the purchase contract shall be deemed satisfied, waived, or released, except for, and then this would be the opportunity to insert any uh, exceptions. So when we um, look at the purchase contract, um, you know, all of the, the contingencies that are involved in there um, go away, right? All of the opportunities for the buyer to cancel, get out. Um, we have to look at the language specifically for each uh, section of the contract and how it would relate. But it is very important to know that when the buyer is taking occupancy of the property under an early occupancy agreement, that they are basically signing over all of their rights to cancel or get out of the um, transaction without any liability. Um, typically, what we'll see as far as occupancy is most commonly toward the tail end of a transaction, um, especially if lending is involved. Uh, the critical contingencies you know that are obvious uh, in the contract are going to be your uh, j1 home inspection period right we certainly want to be able to cross that threshold at a minimum because that's the pretty significant um, opportunity for a buyer to do their due diligence and understand um, the condition of the property from there um, lending uh, is another big one and conditional loan approval is a pretty big threshold um, that happens usually around the uh, 30 days after acceptance 14 days prior to close window of time of course there can be some flexibility there um, <clears throat> but if you have clients if you're working with a seller client and you receive an early occupancy agreement form you want to make sure that this transaction is indeed going to get to the finish line and that the clients are going to be able to close. So the further along in the transaction you are, the more assurance that you have that you'll actually get to the finish line. Um, so keeping in mind, at least having the buyer conduct their home inspection per J1, and if they're getting lending, getting a conditional loan approval, and reviewing the terms of what the conditional loan approval include. Um, there's always going to be some standard items in there regarding um, the buyer obtaining insurance for the property, but when you look at that document closely, it's going to give you any information that's pertinent to their ability to close. And if that looks good for the most part um, and seems doable um, and the seller feels like it's doable, then that would be an appropriate time for um, a buyer typically to take early occupancy um, without any major concern that the transaction could actually be in jeopardy and not close. Does that make sense, everyone? Can I get a thumbs up or a happy face before we continue on too far? Okay, cool. 
Now, early occupancy fee. Okay. Um, buyer shall pay seller blank amount of dollars uh, per day. It is estimated that the early occupancy period will be from the date of occupancy up until the scheduled closing date. The total fee for early occupancy shall be blank, which shall be paid to the seller through escrow prior to occupancy. Should the scheduled closing date be extended, buyer shall deposit to escrow any additional early occupancy fee computed on a daily basis for such extended period. So coming up with a uh, daily amount, you're going to want to um, insert that here. How many days are they going to be in the home prior to closing? Um, again, we're estimating this. If you didn't have to use the extension and your closing date was set on a certain date, do the math, compute it. What's your daily rate times the amount of days are going to be in there? And that's what we're going to use um, to be for the total um, amount, which is going to need to be paid to the seller through escrow. And um, from there, if there are extensions that are required based on the number of days in the extension at the rate that was um, agreed upon, that's going to be the secondary deposit made um, to the to escrow for the seller's uh, benefit uh, to remain in the home prior to closing. Okay. Alterations to the property. This is a really important one. Buyers shall not make any alterations to the property before escrow is closed, right? So especially if you have a buyer who's really excited about doing some remodeling, changing the kitchen, the bathroom, the lanai, putting in a pool, any of those items, we want to make sure we're very clear with the client, maybe even having them initial next to this particular line item number five um, to make sure they're aware, no changes. Um, some uh, sometimes clients would like to put up artwork and that's a, a nail, you know, and a hole in the wall. Um, there can be exceptions, um, you know, for minor, minor changes uh, in that regard. However, if your client is wanting to do that, please, you know, be a responsible real estate agent, have a conversation with the listing agent, get a green light, um, make sure we get it in writing, and that way we've really covered our bases, right? So anytime uh, we, and we wanna let our client know what the rules are, if there are any exceptions, let us know. We as the realtor will connect with the other side, and that way everybody stays um, out of hot water. Number six, uh, failure to close and the responsibilities of um, each part, depending on the reasoning for that. Um, section A here, in addition to those remedies provided for in the purchase contract, if buyer fails to perform or close any of buyer's obligations pursuant to the purchase contract, right, seller, the one not being in fault, buyer shall, number one, Vacate the property within X amount of days. Typically, you can put in here 7 to 14 days. You want to be reasonable. You know, how, met, how many possessions and what's the volume of belongings by the buyer that are in the property? Realistically, how long is it going to take them to uh, move out and potentially even need to find a place to go to? Um, so we do want to allow a realistic amount of time. Number two, pay the seller for each day of occupancy, or excuse me, pay the seller blank, right, for each day of occupancy in addition to the occupancy fee charged under paragraph uh, four above. So this is a different dollar amount, right, separate from the early occupancy fee um, that the buyer would be obligated to pay to the seller um, during this time that they need to uh actively vacate the property um, there. That can be any dollar amount that's agreeable to the buyer and the seller. Number three, pay all fees and costs incurred by seller, including reasonable attorney's fees uh, to enforce the terms of the contract. So it can be a very heavy um, financial obligation to the buyer if they fail to close and are um, exercising an early occupancy contract. 
And then in section B below, um, it talks about just the opposite, right? So in addition to remedies provided for in the purchase contract, if a seller fails to perform the obligations, buyer not being in fault, then the seller shall, one, reduce the occupancy fee charged under paragraph four, two, and what that amount is, <clears throat> per day from the date of buyer's occupancy through the date the buyer vacates the property. Number two, allow buyer to vacate the property within blank amount of days after receipt of written notice from the seller to vacate. And number three, pay all fees and costs incurred by buyer, including reasonable attorney's fees to enforce the terms of this contract. Um, again, number six, letter B, Number two, you want to probably put in there, you know, seven to 14 days, depending on um, what's realistic and reasonable for the clients. And C, should this uh, purchase contract be canceled or should escrow fail to close for any reason, buyer shall restore the property to its condition as of the date of occupancy at no cost or expense to sellers. So buyers are agreeing to that commitment also. Okay. Um, as you fill in section number six, um, we want to be reasonable and we want to discuss with the agent on the other side what would be uh, reasonable for their client. However, you know, think about who your client is, right? Who your client is, what the situation is, what's going to be to their advantage, and uh, being a responsible realtor, uh, we want to make sure we can fill in the blanks um, ideally in a way that is um, favorable to our client, but fair uh, and friendly to the other side. Make sense? Yes. yes. Cool. So we're going to go on to page two here. Uh, responsibilities, number seven at the top, responsibilities of seller and buyer. So here we're just going to check all that apply. Uh, letter A, from the date of occupancy, buyer shall maintain the condition of the property and shall be responsible for the maintenance, repair, and payment for the following utilities and services. And so we're just going to check all that apply. Um, whichever uh, services or utilities are applicable to the property here. Uh, and then buyers and sellers can make arrangements if, um, you know, payment is, is paid to the companies, uh, the relative companies, any particular way. Just know there's a little bit of flexibility there. And then keep in mind um, that we want the clients to have an opportunity to change the utilities for electric and water and such into their name. Um, and sometimes that takes a couple days notice in advance. Um, just something to mentally plan for your client. You don't want uh, the seller to turn off the utilities, no water, no power, and your client moves in the next day and they haven't been made aware of the need to turn the utilities on in their name. Just an inconvenience and, and can easily be avoided. Okay, letter B, buyers shall abide by all laws governing reg government regulations, leasehold provisions, and homeowners association rules, if applicable, relating to the use or occupancy of the property. So they are expected, a buyer occupying the property is expected to follow the rules, be a good neighbor, um, adhere to any uh, laws or rules or regulations that are in place, um, just as the, the seller would be obligated to. Letter C, no pets may occupy the property without written consent of the seller. Um, making a note here on this one, um, where we list the permitted occupants, this is an opportunity to say Mr. and Mrs. Smith, their two children, and uh, a dog named Fido, or um, any other pets that may um, need to reside with them. And you can be more specific and include indoor and outdoor if that is applicable. Um, but that is one area that we can address uh, the pet situation if that applies for our clients. 
Letter D, buyer shall allow seller or seller's authorized agent access to the property during reasonable hours with one day uh, prior notice for the purpose of inspecting the property until escrow is closed to ensure that buyer is abiding by the terms and conditions of this contract. Okay. Um, the Hawaii Landlord Tenant Code right is always 48 hours notice two days and a reminder because this agreement does not fall under that provision in that statute uh, one day's notice is allowable we do want to be uh, reasonable and advise our clients to be reasonable if we're working with the seller um, they should not be you know wanting to attempt access on a, on a daily basis um, that's a really strong intrusion but as time goes on um, if they do feel it necessary um, to access the property that would be the notice required uh, in order to enter okay. uh, letter e seller shall maintain an insurance policy for fire and extended coverage and ability on the liability on the property through the close of escrow seller should be aware that this early occupancy contract may compromise or possibly negate coverage under seller's homeowner's insurance policy and should consult with the seller's insurance agent prior to signing this contract. Right? Essentially, the sellers need to keep their insurance policies in place until the close of escrow. Any risk of loss remains with the seller. So want to make a highlight there um, on a letter E that we need to advise our client if we are the listing agent, we need to advise the seller to consult with their um, insurance agent and to um, make sure that all policies remain in effect uh, or if any changes need to be uh, adjusted. Okay, letter F, buyer shall obtain liability insurance in the minimum amount of, and buyer shall also obtain insurance coverage equivalent to coverage currently in place or an amount equivalent to the replacement cost of the property buyer shall deliver to seller within two days prior to the occupancy the certificate of insurance identifying the seller and brokerage firms as additional insureds if you guys have an opportunity to take a note um, make a note or highlight if you have the form handy, um, that's going to be an important provision that we want to make sure um, is included in their um, insurance, the buyers obtaining insurance. Subject to the seller's review and approval within 24 hours of receipt. So as the buyer's agent, we advise the buyer uh, typically going to the same insurance agent who is putting coverage in place for their future homeowner's insurance, going to the same agent, um, advising them of the early occupancy um, and obtaining coverage for the early occupancy uh, period of time. Um, we can always ask and request from the seller's agent a copy of the existing uh, policy amounts and coverage amounts so that we can ensure we are um, putting in place sufficient coverage um, when the seller has an opportunity to review it everything will uh, look correct g oh what amount should be Thanks, Raquel. So what amount should it be purchase price? Not necessarily the purchase price. Um, so the steps would be, right, easiest steps to, to work through would be requesting as the buyer's agent um, the coverage amounts from the seller. Um, we can, you know, get a doc documentation if we need, but take those amounts and have the buyer discuss with their insurance agent, um, putting coverage onto the property, letting them know this is currently what's in place, and then having the buyer and the buyer's insurance agent discuss what uh, coverages would be appropriate. Um, and I say that in case their um, the, the seller's existing coverage may not be sufficient, according to what the buyer's insurance agent tells and when we think about the contract, right? We always stay within our lane as a real estate professional. 
and anything that um, any areas of expertise that are needed outside of our scope of oversight, we really want to loop in those people. So um, when we talk about insurance, we go to the insurance people, just like all the other specialties involved. But really great question. Thanks, Raquel, for asking. Okay, um, letter G, seller and or seller's insurance uh, shall not be responsible for damage or loss to buyer's personal property. Um, that is just another note that the buyer should be discussing with their insurance agent um, to possibly secure renter's insurance for their um, personal belongings. Letter H, buyer and seller agree to hold harm, hold brokerage firms and their licensees harmless from any and all liability or claims for damage to the property or injury to buyer and others ar arising out of this contract. So again, this is just reinforcing that very um, heavy statement uh, on page number one that talks about the liability that the buyer uh, and responsibility that the buyer is assuming as they're taking occupancy of the property. Uh, number eight, permitted occupancy. The following persons are authorized to occupy this property prior to close of escrow. No additional occupants are permitted without written consent of the seller. So in the space provided, we do want to list the occupants' names. Um, we talked about adding any existing pets that may be coming with them. Um, and then optional um, as the buyer's agent. You might want to think about writing in uh, guests from time to time. As a seller's agent, you might want to be aware of seeing um, those kind of open-ended uh, occupants or visitors, right? And just, again, going back to who is our client, what is their, you know, in their best interest, and advising them accordingly um, and completing the document uh, according to what is acceptable to them. Number nine, additional terms and conditions. Um, this is a free-for-all, right? It's an open section that can address anything that isn't already touched on uh, through num in numbers one through eight. Um, typically, um, we've seen things um, in the past uh, that are possible to address uh, seller mail forwarding. Um, Keys or passes, you know, are there any special uh, pool passes or keys or parking passes? Um, inventory. Um, is there any inventory related items or furnishings um, that are um, going to be remaining in the property um, during this early occupancy period? prior to J8 where the seller is taking out any of their belongings um, or any inventory that's just, you know, passing on to the buyer. Um, any specific needs for uh, parking direction or instructions? Um, that's what you would use this space for here um, and any other uh, items that are pertinent for your, for the particular property or clients. Okay. Conflict in terms. In the event there is a conflict between the terms and conditions of the purchase contract and this early occupancy contract, the terms of this early occupancy contract shall prevail. Right, so we can consider your um, J3, your J8, your J9. Um, those are all covered uh, back on page one in J3, or excuse me, in number three, where we talked about um, no further contingencies uh, remaining in place. And then at the bottom here, we have the clients acknowledge. Um, on the left hand side, we have the buyer's information and signature. And then on the right hand side, we have the seller's um, names and signatures there. And that wraps up our early occupancy contract. A lot of information in the two pages. Um, it's really designed to be a catch-all, 
but from time to time, um, you know, there may be nuances that um, we need to address or touch on. Always feel free to reach out to the broker team. Um, we're here to help you um, work through completing the document uh, to the best of our, our client's um, position. Okay. Do you guys want to do post-occupancy contract? We have about 20 minutes left in our time together here this morning. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, thanks, Nancy. Let's uh, get this switched out. Have you guys learned anything new in this class today so far? Ten o'clock, Nancy. Pretty, pretty similar to Virginia. Just, I think Virginia is a, a lot more decentralized. You don't need a broker signature for almost anything, except for listings. Virginia is one of many states that um, operate as such, and um, you know it's 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 hard to wrap our heads around you know, coming from such a heavy broker oversight state. Um, and the intention, of course, is just to, you know, avoid lawsuits and advising our clients. We would rather, you know, our, our approach to the contracts and, and the transactions are, let's work out all the details before we come to an agreement rather than throw everything in a basket. And then as we're sifting through it, go ahead and, and make any adjustments or amendments <laughs> but definitely a different approach nancy do you have your team meeting right now are you listening into both no i'm just with you here i can okay. i'll listen to the recording on the team meeting oh okay cool appreciate that okay so here we are um we've got the post-closing occupancy contract um and a note that both of these are included in Section D of the purchase, co purchase contract. So um, if you're an agent uh, drafting client's contract and you know this, these are already going to be made part of it, um, please make sure that you mark the um, appropriate section of the purchase contract, Section D, and the bracket next to it. Um, this document is laid out very similarly. It's two pages um, and laid out in a similar fashion. Uh, we st always start off at the top with the purchase contract reference date. That's page one from the purchase contract. And we reference the uh, address and the TMK for the property. Um, the bold language at the top is strongly advising clients, right? Sellers shall not be deemed a tenant under the Hawaii Landlord Tenant Code. Uh, seller may maintain possession of the property on a day-to-day -day basis after the closing date, subject to the following terms. The undersigned acknowledge that they have read, understood, and agree to the terms, conditions of this purchase contract and have not relied upon the advice from licensees and or brokerage firms involved in this transaction. Okay. And clients are advised to discuss with their legal counsel um, and tax advisors any advantages or implications there. And jumping right into it, buyer and seller agree to the following. Number one. Sellers release and indemnification. Seller does hereby release and discharge buyer absolutely and forever from any and all claims, demands, or rights of actions or suits which seller now has or may have against buyer arising out of or to arise out of or relating to or connected with in any way directly or indirectly whether asserted or not or unasserted to date and whether known or unknown 
That's the big one, right? Whether known or unknown. The activities of seller or seller's licensees or other representatives relating to seller's post-occupancy of the property. And then the second half, seller will indemnify, hold harmless, and defend buyer from any and all liability. Claims, losses, damages, including foreseeable and unforeseeable consequential damages. Costs and expenses, including attorney's fees, directly or indirectly arising out of or attributable to the activities of the seller or seller's licensees for the represent representatives relating to seller's post-occupancy of the property. A strong, strong warning. Number two, occupancy date. Seller shall be permitted to maintain occupancy of the property from the closing date to, and then we're going to insert what that date is. Um, you can insert a hard date as in a calendar date or X amount of days, no later than uh, or not to exceed. Um, so some different ways that we can fill that in depending on um, what the needs of the buyer and seller are. Number three, occupancy fee. Seller shall pay the buyer what daily amount, right, per day uh, to maintain occupancy of the property after closing. The initial total estimated occupancy fee shall be what the daily rate is multiplied by the number of days indicated number two, what that total amount is. In the event of an extension of seller's post-occupancy period, seller shall pay buyer such additional occupancy fee estimated for any ended period to the commencement of such extension period, right? Those payments are always made in advance to escrow uh, or through escrow to the buyer, just like we have in the other early occupancy agreement. Security deposit. Seller shall also pay blank amount as a security deposit for any and all sums to which buyer may be entitled relating to any damage or restoration costs during the seller's occupancy. Any unused balance of the security deposit shall be returned to the seller no later than 10 days after the possession, after possession is returned to the buyer. Security deposit amount. So that is negotiable. Um, buyer and seller will need to agree on what that number is. Um, it can be relative to what the market value uh, of the rental rate would be. Um, I've seen it done that way um, or in relation to what the sales price of the property is. Um, it again is just uh, agreeable between buyer and seller and um, the note to make here again this is the post occupancy agreement doesn't fall under the landlord tenant code under the landlord tenant code um, the owner would have 14 days to return the security deposit in this instance um, it is a different arrangement in that the remaining security deposit is returned to the buyer no later than 10 days um, after uh, vacating Number five, payment. The total occupancy fee and security deposit shall be made um, directly from the seller to the buyer by way of cashier's check or certified check upon the effective date of uh, post-closing occupancy. Okay. So after this is signed and before occupancy date, ideally. Number six, no alteration to the property. The seller shall not make any alterations to the property after closing and shall not um, subject the property to any attachment, lien, charge, or other encumbrance. And that's a, a pretty broad uh, statement. Um, but essentially, you know, if there um, is an inventory of, of items that are provided from the seller to the buyer per the contract, then we'll want to make sure that those items, you know, remain any TVs that are on the walls. Um, removing those would be considered an alteration as an example. Okay, think through it. Um, if anything comes to mind as you're working with a client, feel free to reach out to the broker team. Number seven, 
responsibilities of seller from the date of occupancy seller shall maintain the condition of the property including all items conveyed to buyer as of closing and shall maintain repair and pay for the following utilities and services and here we're just going to check any of those that apply um, little reminder here again that once the sellers are vacating the property that the buyers will want to ahead of time get a hold of any utility companies and have the utilities turned on in their name water power um, and cable internet any of those that apply um, giving them a couple of days notice in advance to switch those over so that they're not left without utilities B, seller shall continue to abide by all laws, governing, government rec regulations, leasehold provisions, and homeowners association rules, if applicable, relating to the use or occupancy of the property. The property shall be used for residential purposes only. No other use of the property shall be permitted without buyer's prior written consent. Okay. That's something that we can... Um, include in the additional terms noted on page number uh, two. If the seller fails to comply with the terms of this post occupancy contract, including demanding the property, damaging the property or violating any applicable rules or restrictions, seller shall have X amount of days upon receipt of the buyer's written notice to correct such damage or violation. Sellers shall be responsible for paying any fines, penalties, or other assessments charged by any government agency, homeowner association, or condominium association arising out of the seller's actions or inactions relating to the occupancy of the property. Buyer may terminate this post-occupancy contract immediately if there is any unlawful use of the property. Okay. C, no pets. Um, buyer may occupy the property without prior uh, written consent of the buyer. Again, that's an item that we'd want to put in the additional terms or in the um, listed document, occupants cited in number 10. Letter D, seller shall allow buyer or buyer's authorized agent access to the property during reasonable hours for the purpose of inspecting the property to ensure that seller is abiding by the terms and conditions of this contract. Buyer or buyer's authorized agent shall provide seller at least 24 hours notice of such inspection. Again, different than the 48 hour requirement under landlord tenant code. Page two. Letter E at the top, seller shall um, obtain liability insurance in the amount of and uh, blank and shall name buyer as an additional insured. Seller shall deliver to buyer the certificate of insurance, identifying the buyer as an additional insured prior to closing. Seller shall further be required to obtain personal property coverage as buyer and or buyer's insurance shall not be responsible for damages or loss to seller's personal property. Um, we as real estate professionals want to direct the clients to discuss this with their insurance agent so that they can um, obtain adequate coverage according to these terms. F no later than X amount of days prior to the end of occupancy, seller shall at seller's expense have the interior of the improvements on the property cleaned. Cleaning shall include all appliances, cupboards, drawers, floors, jealousies, screens, and windows. Seller shall also have the interior carpets professionally shampooed. If pets are allowed, Seller shall have the interior of the property treated for fleas and ticks by a licensed pest control operator. Prior to the end of the occupancy period, seller shall schedule a final walkthrough um, date and time with the buyer. Um, so that might sound familiar because that's uh, the language that is pulled from the uh, J9 final cleaning uh, of the property um, per the purchase contract. And so 
um, the seller's expectation to have the property professionally cleaned um, is deferred from the period of time prior to close of escrow to the period of time here prior to their uh, vacating the property. But the same steps occur. They are required to clean the property and then a final walkthrough is conducted um, where the buyer has the opportunity to make sure that everything is in the same condition, the cleaning has been completed, and if there are any um, disputes in that regard, um, the buyer has the assurance of leaning on the deposit um, to ensure that those um, things are done sufficiently and adequately. Number eight, responsibilities of buyer. Buyer shall acquire the necessary insurance policy for fire and extended coverage and liability on the property effective from the closing date. Buyer should be aware that this contract may compromise or possibly negate coverage under buyer's homeowner's insurance policy and should consult with buyer's insurance agent prior to closing. So highlighting that section, having your client, if you're working with the buyer, initial it um, and directing that they have that conversation with the insurance agent that they are obtaining their homeowner uh, insurance coverage policy for or through. Number nine, holdover occupancy. If seller maintains occupancy of the property beyond the occupancy date, seller shall be deemed a holdover buyer and shall be liable for twice the occupancy fee. You want to underline that or make note of it on a prorated daily basis for each day the seller remains a holdover occupant. Upon demand, seller shall return all keys to the property to buyer, remove all of seller's personal property, and clean the property. Buyer may immediately proceed with a summary possession action to regain possession of the property. Seller shall be responsible for buyer's reasonable attorney's fees and costs for the enforcement of this post-occupancy contract. Right. So very clearly identifying, you know, the way that the buyer would need to proceed, um, of course, consulting with uh, their legal, uh, their attorneys on, on what this provision means and um, the details within um, walking them through what those steps look like. Um, they'd want to consult with an attorney directly. Doesn't happen often but when it does um, at least this provision is here um, to give the buyer some clear direction on on how to regain access and control of the property number 10 permitted occupants the following persons are authorized to occupy the property during the seller's post occup post closing occupancy period no additional occupants are permitted permitted without prior written consent so here we want to list the existing residents, the existing occupants, um, any pets, and uh, the term guests from time to time may be used depending on who your client is and what their um, uh, tolerance level or, or flexibility is there. You'll want to discuss that with them one-on-one. -on -one. Number 11, additional terms and conditions. Uh, this is the catch-all, anything that needs to be included. Um, if you have um, extensive terms that need to be cited in here for particular reasons, um, you can always um, insert an addendum, see addendum one, see addendum A, however you'd like to letter that, um, and then use that full body page to um, itemize what those addition, additional terms and conditions may be. Okay, uh, number 12, conflict in terms. In the event there is a conflict between the terms and conditions of the purchase contract and of this post-closing occupancy contract, the terms of this post-occupancy closing contract shall prevail. So make note of that. When we're, we're reviewing both of the documents, pro purchase contract and post-closing occupancy, um, that is the post-closing occupancy is what prevails. All capitalized terms appearing herein that are not defined shall have definitions given to them, uh, given to such terms set forth in the purchase contract. And lastly, number 13, survival after closing. This contract shall survive closing of the transaction contemplated under the purchase contract. 
Okay. Generally, everyone is released after the close of escrow. This uh, document stipulates uh, otherwise because of the nature of the um, arrangement between buyer and seller. On the left-hand side, buyers are going to sign to acknowledge and agree. And then on the right-hand side, sellers are going to um, acknowledge and agree based on their signature. Guys, we made it 1029. A few seconds to spare. Are there any questions? Can I get a smiley face if you're still listening, awake, attending? <laughs> Thanks a lot, team. I, I appreciate you you being here this morning, taking some time out of your day. Um, it's always great to add more tools to your toolbox um, and be prepared and equipped to have these conversations uh, with clients and understand what contracts um, are available to you in as you conduct your business. Uh, the broker team's always here uh, to help agents and uh, with whatever you need. Have a beautiful day. Um, we'll leave it open for questions or comments for a few moments. Um, but take care, everyone. Happy Aloha Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks, Antone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. I'll hop on contract shortly.